Each week, American History TV's American Artifacts visits museums and historic places. The two-party system that we know today is going to begin here, and it's going to begin with issues, much as you would expect. Early issues that we'd face as the United States would be debt. We had debt and spending arguments and debates in this building. It's not any different except for you know, the details as to what we do today in Washington, D.C. We argued about debt from the Revolutionary War, our early government, Alexander Hamilton, the Treasury Secretary, wanted all the debt from the states to come to the federal government uh, and then to use that debt, paying it off to build credit for the young United States. And not everybody agreed with his plans. So you start seeing division. And then foreign policy questions would arise. Britain and France go to war in the 1790s. And a lot of Americans would feel like we owed France. They helped us in our war. We still don't like the British very much. But for George Washington, the, the first president, the notion of neutrality is preferable. We don't really have any money. We didn't really have a navy at all, and our army was not much to speak of, so we certainly weren't in a position to go and fight a war, certainly not in Europe, and probably not even fighting our neighbors in British Canada in those days. So, so he's going to present with his cabinet approval a neutrality proclamation which starts again dividing us into this question of ought we be doing more to help France. Now in the same notion of keeping us out of war, George Washington will send John Jay, who was at that time our first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, send him to Britain to negotiate a new treaty with the British and again with the idea of keeping us out of this European war and settling some of those questions of border and, and ocean rights and such that we were arguing with the British. Uh, John Jay had been on the team that negotiated the peace treaty that ended the Revolutionary War, so he seemed like a good candidate for Washington to send. Well, the treaty that he brought back becomes very controversial and really one of the, the tipping points in creating these two parties as sort of leading to what we know today. Um, the treaty is basically starts becoming publicly attacked in the press. The press of the what would become the Democratic Republican Party, the party of men like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, would start vilifying this treaty. Now what's interesting is nobody's actually read it. It hasn't been published yet, but yet it's going to be pilloried in the press to the point where an awful lot of people hate this treaty that they don't actually know anything about. The Federalist side, this is the side of the John Adamses and the Alexander Hamiltons, uh, is in favor of the treaty. They're in favor of kind of building the young economy of the United States, staying out of a war, trading with all sides in Europe, not being you know, limited by alliance to France or something like this. So we're really seeing this treaty become kind of a symbolic head point between these two sides. And the Senate approves the treaty. Now. According to the Constitution, Senate approves treaties and they're done. Now the problem is the House of Representatives, this is our first treaty ever, the House of Representatives basically says we want a chance to discuss this treaty as well. And so they demand of Washington to see all the papers and so on. Well, he says no, you know, Senate approves it, you guys don't have anything to do with it. So what the House essentially is going to do is they say, well, maybe what we'll try to do is take away the funding. We won't pay for this treaty. Anything that has to be paid for, we'll just not spend the money. Therefore, the treaty will effectually die at this point in time. Um, so that's not necessarily a new strategy that you see th with things in Washington, D.C. today. So, so the big fight in the House of Representatives in this room is whether or not to pay for this treaty. And there's days of debates. And on the last day, there's a big crowd in our public balcony. Uh, you have men like Vice President John Adams, uh, Supreme Court Justice is sitting in the balcony. And the big, this is of course an era where we love our speeches, long political speeches, deep infused with rhetoric. And the best speaker of the time is a man named Fisher Ames. He is a Federalist. He is definitely wanting this treaty to survive. But he's been ill. He hasn't said anything. And of course, this last day, everyone's waiting to see if he'll make the last statement about it. And he does. He stands up and he sort of begins by saying, well, if my strength can hold out, I'd like to say a few words on the subject. 
He proceeds to speak for over an hour. Uh, I think it's about 55 pages in the congressional record, his speech. He collapses at the end into his seat, but he talked about the last war that we fought with the British, and if people remembered all the devastation, and do we really want to do this again, fight another war for years? And, uh, you know, apparently men, some of the men have tears in their eyes. And when he finally finishes, uh, S Supreme Court Justice James Iredell turns to Vice President John Adams and says, my God, isn't that man great? And Adams says, yes, indeed he is. Uh, so the treaty will end up passing by just a couple of votes. At one point, there is a uh, committee of the whole vote. The head of the committee of the whole was a man named Frederick Muhlenberg, who was our first Speaker of the House, and he breaks the tie. Now, he is ostensibly on the Democratic, Republican, the Jeffersonian side, so he should be against the treaty, but he's convinced that maybe not going to war is a good idea, so he, he ends up voting to pass the bill for the funding of this treaty, and he is vilified. He is vilified that he, he voted for this treaty against his side to the point where he loses his seat in his next election to Congress, but even worse, in the short term, he is stabbed on the sidewalks of Philadelphia by his brother-in-law because of his vote. He survives, but I'm sure family gatherings become a little awkward after a while.